Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of People, Places, Planet. My name is Georgia Ray, and I am your regular host. Today, we are bringing you an episode from the Enforcement Angle series, a partnership between the Environmental Law Institute and Sidley Austin LLP. Through this series, our goal is to discuss state and federal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations with senior enforcement officials and thought leaders on environmental enforcement in the United States and globally. On today's episode, the main moderator will be Maureen Gorson, an environmental partner at Sidley Austin. Before rejoining the private sector, Ms. Gorson held several senior environmental positions in the California government, including serving as the former general counsel of the California Environmental Protection Agency, the former general counsel of the California Natural Resources Agency, and the former director of the Department of Toxic Substances Control. Maureen will be joined by the host of the series, Justin Savage, a partner and the global co-leader of the environmental practice at Sidley. Maureen and Justin's guest on the podcast will be Dr. Stephen Cliff, the Executive Officer of the California Air Resources Board, or CARB. Before recently rejoining CARB, Dr. Cliff served as Administrator of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, in the U.S. Department of Transportation. Steve, it's good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Maureen. It's good to see you, too. Yes, so we're going to start this podcast off easy. We want to give the listeners a sense of who you are before getting into policy and legal discussions. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, your interests growing up? Yeah, thank you very much. I grew up in Northern California in a small town called Napa. And my mom worked in a florist and my dad was a general contractor. He built houses and did home remodels and some light commercial work. So I grew up kind of in construction, also spent a long time, a lot of time at the florist when I was a kid. My parents worked very hard, but I also grew up on a ranch. And this was a working ranch, but it wasn't the primary provider for our family. These other jobs were. But what was great about growing up on the ranch is a lot of open space, and it really gave me a love of the outdoors and of hard work. And actually, to this day, the ranch is still in the family, and I spend my entire weekend at the ranch working on it. And in 2017, a big fire went through and actually wiped out most of the houses and buildings, which was very unfortunate, and it also killed a lot of the trees. So I have spent the last six years or so doing a lot of cleanup since that fire and trying to rebuild things. And honestly, just this year with all the rain, things are looking green, the wildflowers are starting to pop up. And it's sort of exciting this spring to see that all that hard work has really come to fruition. And I love going there even even more than ever because of that. It, it's starting to look really great and it's a great opportunity for me to get out of work and go create that sweat equity in a way that, you know, that's very rewarding. Yeah, Stephen, I saw in your background, you're a UCSD graduate and my son Alex is a UCSD senior. I'm glad you're a Triton, but just surprised that people are able to leave La Jolla. Uh, It's a beautiful area with a bit of decent weather. (laughs) It is indeed. Yeah, I went to UCSD in 1988 and at the time there were two draws. One, I have some family in San Diego, so I knew people that were close by and they were kind of urging me to come to San Diego. But secondly, it was the farthest UC from home. And it really, that ended up being a deciding factor. I looked at a lot of different schools and the deciding factor when you're 18 years old is, well, how far away can I get? And UCs were really the the option that I thought of at the time. I've been obviously a lifelong Californian and really love the state. So it was an opportunity for me to continue my education in California, but get kind of as far away as possible. It is an amazing place. And at the time, the University of California at San Diego was really starting to expand, and it has ever since then. It's amazing to see when I go back there today, I hardly recognize it, the number of new buildings, 
in engineering and the sciences, in the arts, the new colleges. There were, at the time, four colleges and then a fifth college during my tenure started. Those have now all since taken on names, but third and fifth did not have names at the time. It's really amazing to see how much growth and opportunity, but it was a very exciting place to continue my education because of its rank in research. And as a scientist, I really appreciated the opportunity to work in such a wonderful place that supported the sciences and that was very focused on STEM and that had a great research program. It was a really exciting place to work. Well, it certainly gave you an excellent foundation. You recently returned to CARB. You spent a lot of time being the assistant to Mary Nichols, the very great chairman of CARB. For listeners who are unfamiliar with CARB, can you give us a sense of the agency's history, its mission, and the key industries that it regulates? CARB, the California Air Resources Board, is about 55 years old this year, and it is California's clean air and climate agency. We are responsible for meeting all of the requirements of the Clean Air Act, the Federal Clean Air Act, as well as the state's lead climate agency. We do the climate planning, and we do the bulk of the climate-related regulations. We work very closely across other agencies in the natural resources area, in the agricultural area, and of course in the energy area to implement our programs. We become sort of the nexus for all of those to ensure that California's climate policies are successful. We have a unique place in regulatory policy here in the United States. And that is because CARB and California's clean air policies actually predated that of the federal government. And as a result, the Clean Air Act, the Federal Clean Air Act, recognizes that unique position and allows California, both due to the fact that CARB and the state's clean air policies predated the feds, and because we have very unique air quality challenges here in the state, It allows us to implement and regulate in ways that would otherwise be preempted by other states. That means CARB, as the designated clean air agency, is able to set regulations for vehicle and engine emissions that are more stringent than the federal government. And other states can follow those rules or follow the federal rules, but other states aren't able to set their own. So we do a lot of science and research to determine what is technically feasible, what is necessary for us to meet our unique air quality challenges, and then we promulgate those regulations. We have to ask for permission from the federal government in order to enforce those regulations, and more than 130 of those waivers and authorizations have been granted by the US EPA. So we, as that clean air agency, have this unique opportunity to regulate industry in a way that's sensible and meets California's needs, but that helps push the science in ways that ultimately can advantage other states to meet their needs. And to some extent, federal regulations have an opportunity to take advantage of the research and learnings that we undertake here at CARB. Well, certainly California is considered a world leader now in efforts to curb the worst impacts of climate change. How do you see the agency's role in the short and long-term future? Well, I'm really excited that we have adopted a 2045 carbon neutrality plan. That's to meet state law, which requires that the state achieve carbon neutrality by 2045. That's all intended to avoid those most catastrophic consequences of climate change, as you mentioned. And that plan really lays out every possible opportunity for us to achieve emission reductions. That includes not only transforming the transportation system and transforming our energy system and rethinking how natural and working lands and agricultural lands help mitigate climate emissions and uptake carbon, but the plan also lays out strategies for how carbon can get removed from the atmosphere with mechanical means as well as these natural and working lands and how we're going to remove carbon from waste streams using carbon capture technology. So it's an all-inclusive type of plan that lays out a real credible strategy for how we're going to achieve those emission reductions. We're excited about it because other areas can learn from things that we've done here. 
not everything is successful. We all have to try different things and figure out what works in our own economy. California has been lucky to have great political support and great popular support for climate mitigation programs. And through a lot of successes over the years, we've been able to establish many different policies which can hopefully be replicated in other areas. What's really important about this is we're not just establishing those policies and getting emission reductions. We're doing so in a way that improves people's lives, especially the people who have been most harmed by pollution historically and ongoing. We can advantage those priority populations, the communities of color, communities that are less well-resourced, and focus our attention in those areas to get benefits for all Californians. But in doing so, we're also growing our economy. We're now going to become the fourth largest economy in the world. So this is at the same time that we're one of the most efficient modern economies in the world and that we're doing myriad programs to address climate and clean air. So vehicle regulations make up a very big part of the portfolio approach that CARB uses to address climate change. Can you tell me how that came about and why? And then what are the biggest challenges to 100% electrification of mobile sources in California? Transportation is the largest source of climate pollution in California. It represents about 50% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. If you include all of the emissions that come out of a tailpipe, as well as all the emissions associated with the production and use of fuels. So that is obviously then one of the areas that we needed to address most readily. If you look at California's policies, our first zero emission vehicle plan was put in place in 1990. Now we were pretty optimistic about that in 1990. And there have been fits and starts. There have certainly been learnings and things where we had to dial it back and areas where we could push more. But what you're seeing at this point is that we're on the precipice of full electrification of the passenger transportation system, such that we now have in place rules and policies that have been handed to us by the administration to get to 100% zero emission vehicle sales by 2035. That's amazing. It's a huge opportunity. It focuses our planning and investment energy into achieving this long-term goal. But it is challenging. It's challenging because you have to think about where the infrastructure needs to be placed. You have to think about those communities who are disadvantaged and have challenges in purchasing the newest vehicles that have the cleanest energy portfolio and those that are fully zero emissions, they tend to be more expensive today than a polluting vehicle. So bearing that cost means that we have to be thinking about incentives. Is there a way that we can make the cost of these vehicles lower to the end consumer? So we have put in place incentive policies to get those costs a little bit lower so that low income consumers have even more potential for getting access to a clean vehicle. But that's not enough. You also have to think about infrastructure. Those of us that have a house with a garage, we might be able to fairly easily put a charging station in our garage to fuel that vehicle. But if you live in a multifamily dwelling, like an apartment building, or you have to park on the street, then getting access to charging is more challenging. So we have to be thinking about all of these policies together. And as well, for those who are the least well-resourced, They're buying used vehicles, and getting those used vehicles on the market means that you have to get consumer products in the hands of the initial buyer and then cycle that through to the used buyer on a relatively quick basis in order for all populations in California to take advantage of these policies. So we're thinking about these strategies in a variety of different ways and really trying to put in place policies that address all of those. The other challenge is just getting electric vehicles on the road is not sufficient. We really need to be rethinking our entire transportation system. That's because just putting more electric cars on the road isn't going to solve other problems that we have. Safety problems on the highways, you know, 40 plus thousand people die as a result of traffic crashes each year. And a large proportion of those now, getting close to a quarter of the total fatalities, is coming from pedestrians and cyclists. And those interactions between a motor vehicle and a bicycle 
or a pedestrian are heartbreaking enough, but when you think about the vehicles getting safer and safer, just electrifying them is not sufficient to make sure that transportation meets the needs of all of our society. And then there's public health impacts beyond the air emissions. Just getting people out and being more active is an advantage. So you want people to be biking and walking, which means you also have to be giving other options. And those options include not only the other mobility choices, but really high quality access to transit, making sure that destinations are closer to origins so that people have access to where they need to go is a total rethink of the transportation system that was built primarily around the car. So it's not sufficient to just electrify all the vehicles and engines. You really have to rethink it such that people aren't relying as much on the single occupant vehicle as a way that they're getting around, that they have more options and that they can get there safely. So CARB and US EPA have long collaborated on air quality and more recently on climate regulations. How would you describe the relationship and how does California benefit? CARB and EPA, and at least in my tenure at CARB, have worked really closely together not only on the transportation side, I think that's where we probably have the closest nexus, but also on stationary source emissions. These are things that create emissions of other greenhouse gases like chlorofluorocarbons or hydrofluorocarbons. Those are refrigerants that are used in air conditioners and home refrigeration to get more efficient and lower emitting type products, as well as cleaner technology that doesn't have chemicals that are as polluting to the atmosphere. Those are areas where we've worked together, as well as on the clean energy space, thinking about market programs and how to get emissions reductions through a variety of these other types of stationary source, we call them programs. But that might include everything from coal mine methane to cleaner power plants. So there's a lot of interaction across a lot of different parts of US EPA and CARB. And we're really excited to have that relationship. We work, especially on the transportation side, we have very frequent meetings. This is an ongoing discussion. I would say we have regular meetings on the order of two or three times per month. And then a lot of ad hoc discussions where at any moment, if I have a question, I know who to call or to shoot off an email and get a quick response. The other area where we've had really close collaboration is on the enforcement side. Once you establish rules, vehicles then need to meet those requirements when they're sold, and that's a certification process. And CARB and EPA really work hand in glove on certifying vehicles and engines. And we use our laboratories together and separately to create information and share that information across the teams in order to ensure that we're getting the cleanest possible technologies and that we're holding manufacturers accountable. So we have done multitude of different enforcement efforts as well as we work really closely together on vehicle certification. There's actually this one little nuance in the way that vehicles and engines are certified that a lot of people don't know about. In your vehicle, if you have a car, there's a so-called check engine light. And that little check engine light, it looks like an engine. If it goes on, if there's a problem with your emissions control system in your vehicle, and then you can go in and get it fixed and the repair person can plug in a little device and tell you what the code is. And that code will tell you, oh, you need some new thing to happen to your vehicle. You need to fix this or put in a new spark plug or whatever the solution is. Well, that check engine light relates to a series of regulations called onboard diagnostics. And it's a system as well as regulations that control what that system does that tells the system how to evaluate your emissions control pieces of the car. And that certification is part of the overall emission certification. So you do an emissions part and you do a onboard diagnostic certification. We actually do that certification for vehicles here in California and for the nation. So in effect, what happens is CARB does the certification and then hands that information off to US EPA. US EPA evaluates it and then ultimately would certify based on CARB's review and certification that we established. And that's a pretty unique position to be in where we're working extremely closely and sharing information in such a way that in effect, 
we're helping to certify vehicles to ensure that they're clean throughout the entire United States. And sticking with vehicles, I mean, you've talked about the close partnership with EPA, your global leadership, but your regulations, I think, barely could be characterized as groundbreaking. They're actually followed by 17 states, and the last I looked, about 40% of the U.S. auto market. How would you describe the benefits of CARB's partnerships with other states and implementing those programs? We benefit greatly from the interactions with those other states. Not only do we learn about unique circumstances in their jurisdictions that can help us think through issues, it also just gives us partners that we can bounce ideas off and have good conversations when you have like-minded interests and outcomes, but different unique public policy and political considerations that we need to be thinking about. So having a relationship with a counterpart in those 17 other states is a great opportunity because if I have a question or if any of my staff have questions, they know who to contact to kind of get more information and very quickly get a response. We have ongoing dialogue and a really strong working relationship. In fact, we meet on several occasions each year, often surrounding various auto shows. As an example, at the New York Auto Show, this is an opportunity when we meet with all of the states and meet with their political leadership to better understand concerns in their jurisdiction and if there's anything that we can do to help address that and vice versa. So we have very good ongoing dialogue there. The other advantage is that 40% of the market that you mentioned, that kind of market power is really important when you're thinking about a regulation moving forward. Automakers need to know that if they're investing to sell in California, which is roughly 10% or a little bit more of the United States vehicle market, that they're making an investment that's gonna pay off. And it really helps to know that there's other states, other jurisdictions that are gonna be purchasing vehicles if they have regulatory requirements that are consistent with California. That gives them the knowledge that they'll be able to sell those vehicles. It's worth investing in the technology. And then you're proving out the benefits of that. The other thing is people that live there breathe cleaner air as a result. They see the benefits of lower operating costs because vehicles are using more and more electricity, which is much more efficient as a fuel source for a vehicle. So there's benefits to the population of those states as well. And you recently served as the politically appointed and Senate confirmed head of NHTSA, the administrator. And has your role as the head of NHTSA changed your view of the working relationship between California and the federal government? Well, I'm always a big fan of moving to other agencies and learning more from others' experience because I do think it broadens your perspective when you're doing your work. And one of the things that was really helpful to learn in the federal government is that the regulators themselves are not that much different. The way the process for developing regulations is very similar. The process for approving regulations, while a little bit different, we have a board at the federal level. I did not have a board. I was kind of the ultimate signatory on a regulatory action. But the people and those who did the technical work behind it, the legal teams that were evaluating the rules and helping to write the rules, that's a very consistent type process. So it's very comfortable in a way to go to a federal agency where you're a regulatory agency, you're doing work that helps improve public health, and that work can then help inform the regulatory efforts back here in California. What I saw between my work at the federal level and at CARB is the single thread throughout my career has really been focused on public health. At CARB, we're focused on it from an emissions perspective. At NHTSA, focused on it from a safety perspective, as well as fuel economy, which has you know, this kind of relationship to how much fuel is burned and therefore reduces emissions as well. So all of those together really are about serving the public in a way that improves public health outcomes. And when you work in an organization, whether it's NHTSA or CARB, that's mission driven, you also, you just see that in the staff and the people that you work with in your teams, how passionate they are about that public health mission. And when they're mission driven, 
They're driven to work hard. They're driven to success. They're outcome oriented. And I saw that in both places. So it's very rewarding to go work at the federal level after having worked at the state and then coming back to the state and just seeing mission-driven organizations that are fostering outcomes in a way that really is in the public interest. That's cool. And talk to us about NHTSA's role in addressing automated driving, including advanced driver assistance systems or ADAS, not to bury people in acronyms, and autonomous vehicles, just some of the work while you were there. That was a really exciting area of work. The so-called ADAS versus automated driving systems breakpoint is based on these levels of automation. And so the first two levels, there's five levels of automation. The first two levels are the driver is in control. And then levels three, four, and five are the vehicle is in control. And you can have both in operation at a given time. For example, level three, the vehicle might be driving part of the time, but the human driver has to be paying attention part of the time. So there's just these different levels of automation and the advanced driver assistance system that you mentioned, ADAS, that's a level two system. That system requires that the human operator is paying attention at all times and is fully in control. Even though you might be able to take your hands off the wheel, some manufacturers advertise these as hands-free, you still need to be paying attention, eyes on the road, focused on what's happening, and completely ready to take over control of the operation of the vehicle at any time. In the, say, level three system, the car can drive itself and you may not be responsible for some of the driving operations, say when you're stuck in traffic, that's the so-called traffic aware type cruise control, and the car can completely take over, you can not pay attention for a bit, If you need to pay attention again, the car is going to alert you and give you time to kind of re-engage and take over. Those are both very nuanced differences because a very good advanced driver assistance system can give you the impression that you don't need to be paying attention. And a level three automated driving system is truly saying you don't need to be able to pay attention, but you need to be able to take over within a few seconds of when it tells you to. So it's kind of a nuanced uh, split there between that weird kind of level two and level three. From a safety perspective, what I found really intriguing is in order to make a determination as to whether something is safe, you really need to know whether it's safer than the status quo. And that's a very difficult thing to make a determination on when trying to think about safety for automated driving systems. So what we were focused on when I was at NHTSA is what are the checks and balances that an entity would go through to make their own determination that the system is safe. And there are a number of different rating companies out there from ISO to SAE to underwriter laboratories, all these different systems that might come up with these different checks for what you would use to make a determination whether the system is safe. And when I was at NHTSA, one of the things we were focused on is, let's look at those different rating systems and see what we can learn and take the best of each of those to put together into an approach that would help the regulator make a determination as to whether the system is safe to use. It's never going to be perfect. The systems are just like humans. They are fallible. And if you think about human crashes, as I talked about earlier, more than 40,000 crashes result in fatalities and a lot of property damage and serious injuries, a lot of economic impact. So human drivers don't have the best track record either, but you can't simply say, oh, the machine should be better than a human. It really needs to be inherently good. And that's a whole new paradigm for how you think about safety for a vehicle, not should it have this type of brake or should it have an airbag or should it have seat belts or seat belt pretensioners? All of those things you can determine, oh yeah, putting in a seat belt, it's better than not. I can do crashes with and without and I can see the outcomes. A seat belt pretensioner, oh yeah, I can do the research and show that that's better than no pretensioner and so forth. But how do I make a determination that an automated driving system is safer than a human driver? That's not really the correct comparison. I guess the last thing I'll say on this subject, at least with regard to this question is, that people are pretty bad at watching paint dry. And that's one of the challenges of a really high quality 
advanced driver assistance system is, I'm telling you, you have to pay attention when you drive. But when you drive it, it feels like I don't have to pay attention. So that's akin to watching paint dry. It's like, no, you need to be here just to make sure it dries, but it's gonna do it on its own anyway. And too often, unfortunately, that results in a number of different outcomes that we've all seen in the news where crashes unfortunately occur and fatalities result. So it's a challenging area to think about regulating. Congress is certainly gonna have more to say on this subject. NHTSA is doing groundbreaking research and they have amazing people on staff that are thinking about these issues. And there's some cool piloting type efforts out there that I think NHTSA is gonna be moving forward with that should help advance the state of play here as well. And if you think about it, both CARB and NHTSA have major roles in regulating the auto and mobility sector. And how do you as a regulator find that right balance between spurring innovation and serving the public interest? Well, first and foremost, we have to ensure that the technology is feasible. Innovating is a great goal and something that we certainly strive to do at CARB. We do so in ways that look to the future, see what's possible, then establish regulations that are sensible and that introduce that new technology as reasonably quickly as possible in order to reduce emissions. And then we evaluate and adjust and we work closely with manufacturers to see what's working, what's not. Do we need to reevaluate our rules? And that's what I was talking about when I talk about our 1990 zero emission vehicle policy, 1990. Back in 1990, zero emission vehicles existed. There were electric cars that one could see on the road, but they didn't evolve as quickly as we thought they would. And that's okay, because we were able to adjust and put in place kind of more reasonable goals, work with manufacturers. Now, at this point, battery chemistry has changed dramatically. The technologies have changed dramatically. And you're seeing every manufacturer in the marketplace has one or two or more electric vehicles available for sale. And some manufacturers only make electric vehicles. So from that early 1990 original mandate to today, you're seeing 20% of the sales in California are now electric vehicles on our way to 100%. And everybody you know has heard of an electric vehicle. This is not something that was kind of a unique little niche kit car sort of idea that somebody had that they built in their garage. Major manufacturers are rolling it out, everything from pickup trucks down to smaller commuter cars and SUVs kind of across the segment. So it's a commonplace thing today when in 1990 it was an idea, we had to adjust, we pushed the envelope. And you know, I'd like to think that CARB had a major hand working closely with those manufacturers that actually have to build the things and make them work and get customers in them. That you know, we work closely together and adjust. And while we may have our differences, it's all been for the better. And what you're seeing today is a whole bunch of different vehicles out there that are actually fun to drive. They meet the needs of every consumer and they're much less expensive to operate. And of course, they don't emit any greenhouse gas or criteria pollution. Well, Steve, we have covered a lot of ground and you are sitting in the catbird seat designing our future. Have we covered every major thing that's going or is there something else we want to leave our audience thinking about as to how CARB is designing our future? What about hydrogen? Is that going to play a role in the future? So let me just address a couple of things. With regard to fuel choices for zero emission vehicles, CARB has been technology neutral. We have not tried to dictate whether vehicle electrification happens with battery electric or with hydrogen fuel cell, instead allowing the marketplace to make that determination. And each different types of fuel, each different approach to the technology can have its advantages and disadvantages. For example, Battery electric requires that you have a charging infrastructure that's sufficiently robust that it can meet the demands of the high uptake of electricity that's required for these vehicles. Batteries themselves are heavy and expensive, so those are considerations when developing vehicles. And there are upstream and downstream impacts, that is, the mining of the resources to actually make the batteries or end of life kind of considerations are all a factor. 
Nothing in that is a negative, it's just considerations that one has to think through. Likewise, with hydrogen, you have to have hydrogen fueling stations. That requires a lot of investment of public infrastructure and the private sector when there aren't the vehicles in the marketplace to actually take that hydrogen and create the economic value for the energy provider. And so those are all various considerations that one has to think through when thinking about whether or not a particular zero emission vehicle technology is appropriate. The advantage that hydrogen has is as an energy carrier, it's exceptionally good for an electric vehicle and it can actually be a much bigger and better opportunity for heavy duty vehicles where the weight of the batteries might be more of a disadvantage. That is, if you're trying to haul freight, you don't wanna be hauling around batteries that are relatively heavy as well. So for long haul applications, there will be considerations for hydrogen as well as for off-road, that is locomotives or for construction equipment. We're seeing a lot of manufacturers that are thinking about hydrogen for those types of transportation sources as well. So they both, I think, have advantages and disadvantages and considerations that manufacturers are all weighing relative to their economic value. You mentioned batteries, and we see that CARB is going to be taking a role in the reliability of batteries. Since that's so key, could you tell us a little more about that? For passenger vehicles, it's important that the consumer know that the vehicle that they're purchasing is going to meet their needs. And one major concern has been around battery life and the ability to fix those batteries if there is a problem. So the regulations in what's called our Advanced Clean Cars program require that manufacturers warranty batteries for a certain period of time and ensure that those vehicles can be worked on. We want to make sure that the consumer has a good experience because if they don't, they're going to switch back to a technology that they know. So having those assurance requirements in the regulation is actually an accountability measure on the manufacturers to ensure that purchasers have a good experience and that we continue to promote electric vehicles in the marketplace. So Steve, wrapping up, we've covered a lot of ground, so it may be appropriate to end with just talking a little bit about CARB's portfolio approach to climate change and what that means. In order to achieve carbon neutrality by 2045, we really need every possible approach to reducing emissions that we can think of. And the way that CARB has approached this, the way that the state of California has approached this, is by thinking about opportunities in each of the emitting sectors, so transportation, energy, natural and working lands, and so forth, in a way that addresses those emissions as a portfolio. And the reason that that's really important is we want to use sort of a belt and suspenders type of an approach. We have a cap and trade program, which provides pricing on carbon so that manufacturers are thinking about efficiency in their operational work. But we also need to address the energy itself. So we have a renewable portfolio standard. We have clean energy requirements. We have clean fuel requirements. We have clean vehicle requirements. And then on top of that, we have a carbon pricing strategy. In this portfolio of regulations that all work together, where one can push a little harder than the other on any given day, allows the best possible outcome for consumers and for the economy. It keeps prices lower. It ensures that the focus is on energy and innovation without raising prices to consumers we can still focus the innovation and efficiency metrics so that the consumer and so that manufacturers are making the right choices from a climate perspective, but overall costs stay as low as possible. Well, I think on behalf of ELI and Sidley Austin and the audience, thank you very much for your time. This is a very exciting time in our country's future, and thank you for letting us know how CARB is working and thinking about all these issues. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the time. It's been great to be here. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, 
comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.